Uh, thank you, Bruce. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm, the, I'm Victor Zhao, the president of the National Academy of Medicine, formerly known as the IOM, and I'm pleased to see all of you here today, despite the weather, and a very important workshop indeed, which is research priority to inform public health and medical practice for domestic Zika virus. I'd like to begin, too, to thank uh, the Assistant Secretary of HHS for Preparedness and Response, Dr. Nicole Lurie, for once again showing her leadership and requesting that we put this workshop together quickly, timely, and of course a very important, on a very important topic. I'd also like to thank the Board of, uh, uh, on Health Sciences Policy for organizing the event, and particularly Jack Herman, who's uh, really put in enormous hours and had to endure all those weariness, concern of those people who can't make it today, almost including myself. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think this is such an important topic. And uh, I wrote down Zika virus once again unprepared. My job is to frame up the uh, meeting today, but to also give you, give me the opportunity to tell you about the recent report that we have response to Ebola and pandemics about what the world should do in preparing for future emergency responsiveness and, uh, and prevention. So just as Ebola pandemic is waning, and I think people begin to forget it, of course now we emerge this Zika virus, a new threat to global health. And many of you know that, in fact, Zika in the Americas was first confirmed in February of 2014 on Easter Island, Chile. Although if you watch CNN this morning, uh, I think one of the American uh, workers, in fact, claimed that he also had it a few years ago in traveling back from overseas. But as you all know, it's been spreading. Since 2015 and 2016, it's been spreading very quickly. Uh, many of you know that in late 2014, Brazil discovered, uh, detected a cluster of febrile rash illness related to Zika virus in the Northeast region. And this link to Zika was confirmed in April 2015. By October, a single state in Northeast Brazil, uh, the uh, Beja, Bahia, pardon me, reported 56,000 suspected cases. You're clearly going to hear a lot more of that, and I won't belabor this except that I would say that it's spreading so quickly that right now Brazilian national authorities estimate that between 497,000 to almost a million and a half cases of Zika virus have occurred since the outbreak began. Now, February 4th, uh, 2016, 26 countries and territories in the Americas have reported local transmission of the virus as you can see, in fact, in this particular slide. Now, the biggest cause concern the virus, not only because it's a very mild illness, at least, you know, when symptomatically, is the link to microcephaly, a condition that's caused babies to born with uh, unusually small heads and vast majority of cases with damaged brains. But also other neurological symptoms, such as Guillain-Barre syndrome and autoimmune-like illnesses, and commonly, uh, these are quite devastating. So as of January 30th, 2016, the Brazilian Ministry of Health reported 4,783 cases of microcephaly or central nervous system malformation, including 76 deaths. Now, many of you know, and you hear a lot more, which I will not certainly go over this, nor am I an expert, that in fact is a virus of the flavi virus family related to yellow fever, dengue, West Nile, and Japanese encephalitis. It's primarily transmitted through the bite of infected Aedes mosquitoes, which is really very prevalent everywhere. And of course, as I said, one in five people become ill, and most common symptoms are really quite mild, conjunctivitis, fever, rash, and joint pain. Now, international organizations responded to these alarming events, and PAHO has issued a series of epidemiologic updates and alerts in 2015, urging enhanced surveillance of Zika virus, as well as neurological, autoimmune, and congenital malformation associations. As you all know, an emergency committee was convened by Margaret Chen, 
the Director General of WHO under the uh, IHR regulations on February the 1st this year, and following the advice of the committee, the DG announced the recent cluster of microcephaly and other neurological disorders reported to be a public health emergency of international concern. Now that's really, to me, a very rapid and bold move for WHO, and considering what's happened in Ebola, uh, certainly we feel that they have been quite responsive. On Monday, February the 8th, CDC announced that its emergency operations center has put this on a level one status. Now CDC has only put its operations center at level one three times, in fact, in its history. So you can imagine how, um, in fact, uh, seriously that the agencies are taking this. I certainly would say that given the uh, range of the mosquito, Zika has the potential to spread very explosively. And of course, it's alarming when you th think about the, uh, the uh, side effects and complications of this. So I think it's imperative that we mount an effective response to Zika itself, and we should also take steps to build a stronger global framework of preparedness and response that will protect us from uh, more effectively from all such threats. Now, as you know, the Institute of Medicine, which is now the Health and Medicine Division of the NRC, has been a lot strong voice in this area in emerging infections. Actually, back 22 years ago, uh, we released a landmark report called Emerging Infections, Microbial Threats to Health in the United States. This report gave recommendations on how to increase U.S. preparedness, and many of these recommendations have been put into action. A forum on microbial threats grew out of this report, and of course, they convened regularly of experts around the world, and since 2007, has prompted notable initiatives in areas of disaster crisis, standards of care, medical surge capacity, engaging public in critical disaster planning decision making, of course, workshops on H1N1, Ebola, and many others. Now, so when you look at this whole situation, and with the WHO declaring the Zika virus as a global public health emergency, I think that it's really time also to take a look at the whole area of infectious disease outbreak and pandemics. This is an article which I co-authored in New England Journal of Medicine, published online on January 13th, which accompanied the report on the global health risk framework. Just look at this almost a little bit over 10 years, the number of pandemics and outbreaks and epidemics. And particularly to me, you can see back even in 2007, Zika virus was in fact uh, detected and had an outbreak at that time. But I think what is, drives home to me is that since 2013 to, or 2012 to 15, we have just a series of outbreaks. So we can hardly celebrate that we're succeeding in any way. In fact, you can see the Zika is only, to me, another wake-up call that we must uh, spring into action. In that context, I think it's very clear, based on the pandemic, uh, uh, Ebola pandemics, and the recent number of meetings, that everybody agrees we need to create a global health risk framework a global architecture to reduce and mitigate the next global health crisis. And certainly before the outbreaks occurs, we identify leaders, roles, resources, appropriate times for responding. Successful containment of future outbreaks requires timeliness and coordinated response informed by good planning, evidence, but not by fear or politics, as we've seen many responses to many of the uh, pandemics. And we need to avoid mistrust. We need to avoid stigma and miseducation of communities. And importantly, certainly for Ebola and now with Zika re-emerging, we want to say we need to learn now before our memories fade. This is why, once again, I want to thank Nikki Laurie for getting us together so quickly, because we need to move urgently, not only in terms of what we do in this country, but also globally. Now, so we were, um, uh, seven foundations, the Gates, uh, Moore Foundation, Rockefeller, Ford, Meng Mei Lao, and Paul Allen Foundation with Wellcome Trust and USAID 
ask the National Academy of Medicine to lead and convene as a secretary a commission to develop global health risk framework. And many of you might have read this report already, which as I said, was posted and launched on January 13th. It's online on our site, but also if you read the New England Journal article special report, you can link it to the entire report. This in fact is a commission that is asking the question, what do we need to do in terms of creating a security framework globally so that we are much better prepared and much better ready to respond to any of the outbreaks. The commission, in fact, is run by an independent body of, as you can see, 17 commissioners come from five different continents, truly international, with broad range of expertise, not only in health, but also in financing, in defense, in many other areas and is oversight by international oversight group. Importantly, it has four work streams, as you can see. It asks the question of global governance in terms of response to pandemics and infectious outbreaks, financing response to emergencies, how to strengthen health systems, and also importantly, R&D in the medical product work stream. Auto, it in fact, um, had 11 days of evidence gathering workshops across four continent, continents in Accra, Hong Kong, Washington, and London, and had input from more than 250 different experts. So this report was in fact, um, uh, and you can see the consultation we did with three commission meetings, and the report was released in thir January 13th. Um, the report name is Neglected Dimension of Global Security a framework to counter infectious disease crisis. I want you to look at this title because this, in fact, to me, is the most powerful statement made to the global leaders that this is not only a health issue, it's a global economic and security issue. And in fact, the key finding of the report is in fact this. It poses threats to global security and economic stability. Lives lost, borders closed, travels spanned, and of course, economic impact. This report went through an analysis to look at how many human lives were you know, affected by pandemics. And if you look at the past 100 years, from Spanish flu to HIV, nearly 100 million deaths altogether. But if one were to look at the cost of the pandemics economically, we had two Harvard scientists or actually in business school and analyze this. Over the last 10 year period, the average cost economically globally is $60 billion a year, which you transfer, translate that into 21st century, that could be as much as $6 trillion a year. Huge impact, in fact, five to 6% of the GDP. So the economic impact is great as is human and others. And that's because the connectedness that we are seeing, of course, in this day in travel, in ubiquitous access to communications, but it fuels the contagion, both of virus self, but also tremendous fear of response. So our report emphasized greatly to not only ourselves, because we all converted, but in fact to the global leaders that they need to step up. They need to step up an investment to actually have emergency response and also preparedness in, for pandemics and uh, infectious outbreaks. The scale, as you can see, is huge and therefore it's proper to make the most important commitment. Uh, when we opened the meeting, launched this in New York uh, a few weeks ago, Dr. Larry Summers, the previous uh, Secretary of the Treasury, opened the meeting and he pointed out that this issue, as big as impact, as uh, climate change, but it's not getting the, quite the national or the global attention. And importantly, if you look at the overall impact or investment in security, military otherwise, it's a fraction of what we're doing because we're always arguing for budgets from health ministers versus seeing this as a global issue. So the um, commission said, that the globe should commit $4.5 billion a year, a fraction, even though it sounds like a big number, to make humanity much safer. 
Of that, 3.4 is to strengthen public health systems. And those, of course, should fundamentally come from many of the countries itself. And we're not asking having a, a hap, hap passing round for, uh, you know, for handoffs. But importantly, we also need to have an international a center for emergency preparedness response, and also contingency funding and the World Bank funding, which amounts to about 150 million. And finally, $1 billion for R&D. You know, that's a small fraction. If you think about a small to medium-sized biotech company, that is, in fact, is the size of a company. So the ability to get people together to think about developing vaccines and drugs and also other um, uh, areas of clinical research, et cetera. So the framework has three major issues. One is strengthening national public health capabilities, infrastructure, and processes to build on a common standard and regularly assess through objective, transparent process fully consistent with the legal obligations under the IHR. Second is a more effective global regional capabilities in terms of response. Let, we believe, by re-energized WHO with enough resources with a dedicated center for health emergency preparedness response and coordinate it with the rest of the UN system, supported by World Bank and IMF. And third, of course, is accelerated program of R&D, deploying all told $1 billion. And we're not asking, again, hat in hand to, for people to put up. Actually, if one were to look at the current investment and put it properly together, one could imagine on an ongoing basis the dollars needed for coordination, prioritization, et cetera. I won't have time to go over the details of the um, of the um, recommendations. Suffice to say that we say that each government and states of government should consider protection from infectious disease threats as part of the basic duty to protect their pres to the citizens. It's not really a health issue. It's really a security protection issue. And that member states should agree on benchmarks on core capabilities for effective systems, and that WHO should develop an external objective, transparent, and accountable assessment mechanism to measure compliance. And importantly, donors should make support the countries contingent on countries participating and complying with those uh, metrics. That also, we have to have a global effort towards outbreak and preparedness. We should develop a high priority watch list that is looked at daily to be released to look at what is going on on watch lists of infections. Uh, establish center, as I mentioned, for preparedness. And of course, being able to mobilize those funds which are needed for emergency, uh, both the World Bank pandemics and the WHO contingency fund. And importantly, to accelerate R&D to create an independent committee to coordinate and prioritize R&D effort and to commit and mobilize $1 billion to maintain portfolio projects coordinated by this committee. So, uh, and of course, importantly, as you will discuss here, of course, and Nikki has already helped us to create another work stream to ask about standards for clinical trials, ability to streamline decision making so that we don't have to rediscover it every time we have an infectious outbreak, and this is all in the works. So let me sum up by saying we need for Zika virus and, of course, for all infectious outbreaks, the importance of public health and health system strengthening. Without that, I would say that we can do all we want, and it's not going to be happening. And can, I can also say that, in fact, this is still a long way to go in many, many countries. Surveillance reporting vector control, education, travel guidance, and research and development. And finally, as this meeting is supposed to address, which is the workshop to bring many of you together and the key stakeholders together to identify, discuss, and explore key factors reduce likelihood of local transmission of Zika in the United States, areas of insufficient knowledge related to key factors and prevention strategies, research questions of specific concern, and critical communication needs of evidence-based information for public health officials, providers, and the general public. 
So thank you very much for being here. I want to thank the speakers and the organizers. And in fact, I look forward to a very exciting day. Thank you. Thank you.